Okay, welcome to a field trip of the tide pools at Pillar Point. So in California, we're lucky to live um, in a beautiful state with a lot of biodiversity. And one of the places a lot we can see a lot of marine organisms is here in the intertidal zone. This is a picture from the bluffs above um, Fitzgerald Marine um, Sanctuary in Moss Beach. And this is just north of Pillar Point where we're going to do our tide pooling. But I wanted to show you this because I wanted to show you how big the Pacific Ocean is. It's huge. And there's a huge amount of different marine creatures that live in there. And most of them have to live underwater. And so the intertidal habitat, this place where rocks become exposed um, from, from underwater, is a really novel habitat where um, it's hard to live. Because this is, this is sort of an organism's dipping its toes into living in the terrestrial habitat. So it has to be surrounded by air and it's exposed to higher temperatures. Really heavy wave action can hit these rocks. And so these organisms that we see in the intertidal are a really special sort of window into the different types of creatures that live subtidally. And in California, the, the coastline, this rocky coastline is dominated by kelp forests, um, but there's many places where you can go and look at the intertidal organisms um, during low tide. Today, we're going to the um, tide pools at Pillar Point, which is just by the just past the marina in Half Moon Bay. And uh, it's a beautiful morning. It's uh, 7 a.m. and uh, quite still a little foggy down here at the coast, um, but a super low tide. So this was a really special minus 1.5 tide, um, which means that those organisms that um, normally would not be exposed to air will be exposed because uh, this kind of tide only happens once a month uh, or even more rarely only six times a year. And you can see that there's a lot of different organisms that are, that are exposed here during low tide. And all of these creatures, um, especially, and, and what you're seeing is a lot of different animals and plants. And so most of the browns and greens you're seeing here on the surface are, are plants that um, can tolerate being exposed to air for, for minutes to hours. Um, and then in these pools, you see a lot of animals, these big green sea anemones, uh, the purple sea urchin, um, and we'll see some starfish um, as we do our field trip. And so uh, this is what the lower inner tidal looks like. We're right up against where the waves crash. So this zone gets a lot of physical energy. It, um, these animals have to be resistant to wave energy. Um, and that's really important for their ability to survive. Um, and, and so you can see like, like these purple sea urchins that are lining the rock walls here. They've dug burrows into those walls um, so that they can actually be protected from, from big swell, big waves. And then this is a, a orange pisaster. And uh, pisaster ocraceus is this sea star that lives in these tide pools. And it's a really important species because it's a keystone predator. And so the patterns of its predation determine um, the whole community diversity. And you can see there's a lot of different things in this community. There's a lot of algae. So the green in the foreground is seagrass. Um, and then there's some red algae and um, some browns, some brown kelp kind of things. We also have a lot of animals. This is the purple sea urchin. It's a really important herbivore. And so by eating plants, it also really contributes to um, the patterns of community diversity within any one particular place. Um, and so these organisms, especially like to live in pools where they can still breathe, they're still covered in the seawater. Um, it's really exciting to see so many pisaster sea stars in this field trip because uh, their populations had a big decline in 2014 and 2015 due to a disease. The disease was starfish wasting disease, and it killed multiple species of uh, sea stars in in along the west coast of North America. I think um, something close to 30, 20 or 30 species were impacted by this disease. And it wiped out the pisaster populations. And this species is so important for um, community diversity that um, there was a really big impact on the ecology um, on the ecology here in the inner tidal. And, and I'm excited to see so many pisaster, frankly. I think that's a sign that they're recovering. It's been five or six years since the, the major outbreak, and it looks like their populations are bouncing back really well. So that's exciting. Um, in this 
lower intertidal, we see a lot of diversity, but when we go higher up into the intertidal, so this is where the high tide line is, um, you see much less. There's less organisms, there's more bare rock. This is where the waves regularly crash. Um, even at mid-tide, they'll crash here. And these organisms have to be able to tolerate being exposed to air for long periods of time. So you see a lot of barnacles. Most of these white things are barnacles, some encrusting red algae. Um, often we'll get high cover even in this higher um, tidal zone. Like these sandy spots we're looking at are little green anemones um, that are covered with sand. And then you can see there's quite a bit of red and brown. Um, there's some seagrass that are in the slightly deeper pools. A lot of barnacles, a lot of anemones, and a lot of red and, and brown algae. And so... Um, this environment, living in the higher upper tidal, is really challenging. You're exposed to sun a lot more than marine, most marine creatures are. Uh, you can dry out if it's really windy. Um, the salinity, if you live in one of these little pools, the salinity really gets elevated because the water evaporates out of the pool. And so you have to be able to tolerate all these very harsh conditions, but you escape predators. Pisaster can't breathe out of water, so it stays sort of in the mid lower intertidal. Um, and we almost never see it in this high intertidal because it, it just can't survive in that, in that zone. And so um, the advantage of being able to tolerate those abiotic conditions is that you, you avoid competition and predation more than other creatures might. And so you can see there's still a lot of bare space. It's just a hard place to live. Um, for most organisms. Uh, these um, mussels and barnacles can actually clam up. They can shut their sort of trap doors, um, their openings, and they can resist desiccation um, by trapping the moisture inside their bodies. And so that's a strategy for them to escape predation. Um, and we know that pisaster is key for the distribution of these, these mussels because they are quite good at resisting abiotic stress. Also in the higher intertidal is this uh, extensive sort of mats of these red algae. Um, this is Endocladia muricata, um, and, and they seem to resist desiccation really well. As a refuge in the higher intertidal are these pools. And so there are some places where the rocks have been gouged out for whatever reason, um, where water collects even during low tide, and that gives marine creatures a refuge where they're still covered in water, um, but, but we can actually see them really well. And so those pools are often sort of packed with life. You see these uh, pisaster right up against um, Xanthopleura, the uh, anemone, and, and that's where all the, the real true marine creatures live. And so we find the most diversity in these pools, um, but you got to get your feet wet to go in and check them out. Uh, but there's some beautiful creatures uh, that that will reside in these pools especially um, snails and and red algae in addition to these purple urchins and, and starfish and anemones um, and so we're looking at some of the algal community right now here at um, pillar point i'm really interested in algal taxonomy and genetics and and community diversity and patterns of of diversity and so um, these big sort of flat towel um, shaped things are um, mostly a red algae. Um, they're kind of, I would call them a leathery red. Some people call them uh, Turkish towel. And uh, Turkish towel is Chondrocanthus exasperatus. And uh, there's a leathery red there. That's a Mazazella, Mazaella splendens. Um, and you can see that's kind of a sargassum brown um, algae. These algae are great habitats for small invertebrates and things to live. They really are um, the ecosystem engineers of these pools because they provide a lot of habitat complexity and structure and food. They're primary producers, so, so herbivores can eat them. Okay, so as an ecologist, I'm very interested in community dynamics and what structures uh, diversity in any one particular place over 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 many places and also across um, time. And so uh, to be able to quantify diversity, we need some standardized methods. You can imagine you could count uh, 10 species in a square meter, uh, but if you surveyed uh, 1,000 square meters, you might find a million, and that's just due to the, to the spatial variance. And so when we compare areas, um, as ecologists, we, we want to use a standardized spatial scale. And so uh, in general, we have two tools for that, quadrats, which are, which are squares, um, and transects, which are lines. And so so we could either count all the organisms in a line 
or we could count all the organisms in a square. Um, for this uh, particular habitat type, the quadrats are, are really easy to use. And so um, in the background there, you can see me. I'm actually taking photos of quadrats here in um, the pillar point area to look at the algal community um, that's there. And so I've I've already placed the quadrats in the lower intertidal, um, and now uh, you can see me in the background there doing quadrats in the mid intertidal. The advantage of these quadrats is I can take pictures of them. They're relatively small. They're, they're a quarter meter square, um, but they give us a good um, rapid estimate of, of the population size and, and density of, of different organisms and percent cover, right? Um, so... You can see I'm collecting a lot of um, photographs while I'm throwing these quadrats, and this is a really nice standardized way to look at communities. And so I'm very interested in com comparing the communities intertidally along an elevation gradient from lower intertidal to mid intertidal I just finished to, to upper high intertidal. And um, I'll find some pattern. Some algae will be distributed in lower and some will be distributed in the higher. And that's really interesting. That's how natural communities are structured. That data won't explain to me what creates that pattern um, because that's really experimental ecology where you got to do an experiment and see if herbivory or abiotic stress is driving the abundance of different um, groups of organisms, either animals or plants. In this case, I'm really interested in the plants. And so here's a picture of the quadrat from the lower intertidal. You can see we got a lot of these blady greens and that's a seagrass. Um, this big, long sort of Turkish towel thing is a red algae. Um, these tufty browns at the top. And then you can see we have a lot of herbivore here. That purple sea urchin is an herbivore. This quadrat is from the middle intertidal, and we have a lot of um, uh, crustose coralline reds that are branching, um, these uh, towel reds again, and then we have the um, herbivore, uh, the black um, turban snail, and so that's pretty interesting. And then here's a picture of a quadrat in the upper intertidal, and you can see that there's much less percent cover of algae. There's some animals in here. There's some anemones that are covered in sand. Um, we have still have some little bits of red algae and brown algae. Um, Looks like we got some snails too. Okay, so that's uh, the research I was interested in doing. And now I just want to tell you a little bit about some of the creatures uh, that we might find on any particular day when we go tide pooling. And so this is a red sponge. Sponges are really hard to identify. I'm going to guess it's in the genus Acarinus, um, but I don't know sponges that well. And, and you need to look at microscopic features to really understand them. Um, and then we can transition to cnidarians, which are um, uh, these big anemones are the most common cnidarians that we see here in the intertidal. Um, then there's at least three or four species of the Xanthogramica. Um, um, and, and they often cover their outer um, tissue in this sand to protect them from sun exposure because they often get exposed during light low tide. For crustaceans, we have a lot of rock crabs. This is a big red rock crab. Uh, beautiful uh, coloration on the back of its um, back. These crabs are almost exclusively in the pools. They've got to breathe water. Um, I often find crabs under rocks. And so if I go through the um, tide pools and flip rocks, I'll see a bunch of different crabs before we found all of these. Just be careful when you flip rocks to not crush anything and, and turn them back down. And here's a little um, Petrolistes, the little porcelain crab that we found. Greg loves crabs. And so we're always uh, trying to show him some, some different creatures. And he was really excited about this. Um, and then we released the, the Petrolistes and let it go. And uh, so it could go back to, to living its life. Uh, and then this is a pretty large kelp crab. Um, Pugetia, that was really exciting to see. And, and then this is a, a hermit crab that we see. And like I say, these are almost exclusively in the pools. Um, sometimes the hermit crabs will come up shallow because they can tuck in their shell and um, avoid desiccation. But these guys are all scavenging random stuff in the intertidal. One other crustacean you might see is a barnacle. A barnacle is like a, a an insect with its head planted on the bottom and it waves its legs in the seawater to collect food. They can close their little hatch just like these mussels, the black mussels in the background can and that protects them from desiccation. Uh, you can see some lit, small limpets on the rock and snails. Those guys are really good at shutting their hatches. Here's a gooseneck barnacle. Um, and then we can transition to the echinoderms, so creatures with spiny skin. Um, and there's there's a bunch of different starfish out there. There's uh, the, the pies actually we've already talked about. And then this is the six-ray leptosteria hexaxis. 
Um, and then another spiny skin is the sea urchin, purple sea urchin. Uh, we're really interested in the ecology of purple sea urchin because it's a really massive herbivore. And some people like to eat it for those gonads, you can, those orange gonads you can see there. One of the last groups of echinoderms are sea cucumbers. Um, these are quite rare in the intertidal, but every so often I'll find um, a pretty one like this. Um, you can see it's got that characteristic spiny skin of the echinoderms. And these guys are just eating sand and bacteria and whatever they can find. Here's a really tiny one at first. I thought it was a new to rank and then I saw its skills. Um, the snails are a major component of the inner title and this was a really huge snail um, uh, red abalone and unfortunately these are really rare to see in the inner title now because they've been over harvested by by people they're delicious and then the um, black uh, turban snail is a really important herbivore that can be found all through the inner title chitin are also important herbivores that um, can go around and scrape the rock and eat the algae uh, one one time one trip to the tide pools we found this um, giant gumboot chitin uh, at um, pigeon point and so that was exciting these are huge they're like the size of a bread loaf and, and they're just herbivores they're crawling around they don't usually make it into this um, shallow intertidal zone um, but we we also found this dead one um, so you can see it's it's uh, calcium carbonate plates on the inside and then this is a limpet um, limpets are really good at sort of sucking onto the rocks and so that helps protect them from desiccation this is a mussel uh, middleus uh, californicus probably and this is a really important habitat ecosystem engineer habitat creator because in these nooks and crannies are a lot of different organisms another type of mollusk is a nudibranch or a slug um, and these slugs can be really beautiful again they have to breathe underwater so they're typically in the pools uh, but they come in all different colors and shapes and just a really gorgeous um, group of animals and uh, and they're typically predators most of the dorids the ones with the circle of gills eat sponges and these the aeolids uh, that have frilly gills these uh, typically eat cnidarians this is the hopkins rose really pretty um, rose color um, and 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 some of these nudibranchs eat uh, anemones um, some eat barnacles um, so they're pretty important predators although small then my favorite predator here he goes no, no, other way, buddy. Other way? The ocean's yeah. the other way. The water's deeper over here. Are Is you going to attack the camera? The water's oh, deeper. there we go. There Come on, buddy. Because back in the little pool, there's a... Wow. So rare sighting of an octopus. I've only seen one or two the whole time I go in, a tide, in a tide pooling. So that was exciting. Okay, now there's a lot of algae. And again, this is kind of the community I'm interested in documenting a little bit um, in my research. And so there's a ton of different types of algae that live in her tidally. Um, and not just marine algae, but also seagrass, uh, which is really a flowering plant, not just an algae. So we're looking at some um, sort of mid-tidal algal communities. Um, and you can see these, again, these sort of towel, these thick, long towel um, things could be multiple species. Uh, um, but I think some of them are um, chondracanthus exosperitus, and some are um, mazaella splendens. Um, and then there's a, a bunch of other really interesting um, reds that live intertidally. Um, there's some really important, um, like tufty reds that really construct that really occupy a lot of space. This is a green algae, um, Ulva, that uh, looks kind of like they call it sea lettuce because it's kind of got thin, leafy green leaves. Um, you can see some more Ulva there, and then uh, back into these reds. Um, you can see that the, some of these reds grow as little clumps here at the base, kind of touching the water, and those clumps are really important. Um, to provide habitat again for small creatures. Um, and, and then this is that uh, Turkish towel red species that I was talking about. In the foreground here, this brown looking algae, I think, is um, a red al algae, um, cal Caliothamnion pikeanum. Um, and then there's another red that lives uh, high up in the inner tidal um, that's really important, Endocladia muricata. And then we have um, red algae uh, also can calcify. So this is a coralline 
red algae in it has calcium carbonate in its cells. And so I study these species. You can see two species in this picture. This is the first one. It's got sort of thick plates um, that segments that build. And then the second species has a really feathery um, looking um, morphology and is quite distinct. And so um, the species of Corlin um, are really poorly understood in California. It's one of my research interests. And, and here's an encrusting Corlin. So it has a different growth form. Um, but it can cover a lot of area. Not a lot of things eat red algae because they're so calcified. Um, so they really are protected from a lot of the herbivory that can happen in these habitats. And then, oh, I just wanted to show you um, some footage of this of this dense red uh, that can that it can sort of fill up uh, the high intertidal um, next to these um, these seagrasses here, um, which are phyllospadix. So that's our uh, tour. I know it feels like it's only been 20 minutes at the, at the, in the tide pools, uh, but really we've been here for two and a half hours. So the tide's coming in. The lower inner tidal is already covered up. Um, we're hiking back out to uh, the, the forefront of Pillar Point, sort of the main area, which is kind of a, an extensive tidal flat. And so it's, it's a nice place to um see a lot of different creatures it's really easy to walk uh but it's not quite as diverse as as the area we were just surveying which has a lot more um ups and downs and a lot more habitat sort of heterogeneity for different organisms to live so it's a beautiful morning it's still kind of chilly out but um it's getting sunny you can see the fog and so i just want to i just hope you all have a great day and i hope you enjoyed your field trip um and this and this slug wants to say goodbye to. Have a great day.